All right, Ethan, can you start by telling me what snow sublimation is? Because that might be a foreign yeah. term for some. Yeah, so you can think of snow sublimation kind of like evaporation. Um, it, it's a little bit different because it is the transition of the ice solid phase directly into the vapor phase, water vapor, um, without necessarily going through this liquid phase of water. Right? Okay, so we all learned that in fifth grade, but it's actually um, kind of this ever-present thing. Now, we don't often think about snow sublimating. We think about it melting. So what causes snow to sublimate, to go from this solid state to a gas state? So really, all of these things are happening everywhere. Snow is constantly transitioning between the solid phase and the liquid phase and the vapor phase. There's an equilibrium occurring everywhere in the world. Um, and what happens is that in really humid environments, so most of the East Coast, the very West Coast, um, you end up with that transition, that the equilibrium, meaning that there's very little net sublimation that on average, the, there's so much water in the air already that this the water basically stays in the snow. Um, and so the only way you lose snow in those environments is by melting it. Um, whereas in really dry environments, so most of the mountains in Colorado, really everything east of the, the Cascades and the Sierra Nevada mountains is a very, much drier environment. And in those situations, this equilibrium goes the other way, where the air is dry, it can always take more water vapor. And so on net, you're losing snow to the atmosphere through the process of sublimation. Why is it important to study snow sublimation? The impact of sublimation versus melt on, for example, water resources is very different. If snow melts, that's great. It goes into the ground, it goes into our rivers, it goes into our reservoirs. If snow sublimates, it's gone. Um, and so we need to understand how much of the snow is sublimating versus how much is melting so that we can make better forecasts for reservoir operations. We can better understand flood forecasting, flood predictions. Um, there's also the, the follow on consequence that if water goes into the atmosphere, it's now available downwind to create clouds and more precipitation. It's a relatively small contribution to that, but it has a, a bigger impact on water resources. Hmm. Okay, so when you say it's gone, that was my first thought was, well, it's going into the water cycle, we'll eventually yeah. get it back. So where is it going if it's not getting back into that? Right. So it's gone from the local setting, right? Ah. It, it's still in the water cycle, it hasn't left Earth. Um, but it doesn't help very much if the places that are already dry are the places that are losing water. And it's going over to places that are already wet, and they're getting more water. Right. So from the Colorado River Basin, which is in this historic drought right now, we're losing water to the process of sublimation. How do you study how much is how much snow is being is sublimating? This seems like a really hard thing to quantify. Yeah, it, it's snow is a beautiful um, thing to study because you can see it, you can go out and touch it and measure it. It's really sort of it's on the surface. It's kind of easy to study. But sublimation in particular is this nebulous loss to the atmosphere, and we can't see that. And so it's much harder to study. There are a lot of different techniques that people use to try to study sublimation. And part of the project we were just involved in was looking at a lot of different techniques to try to better understand what we're seeing in different measurements. The kind of gold standard, the, the most reliable way we think to measure sublimation is using an instrument that uses what's called eddy covariance. So in that, yeah, really complicated, weird thing, right? Where we actually put out these anemometers, so wind speed measurements, that are measuring the three-dimensional wind, not just the two-dimensional, how fast is it going in what direction, but three dimensions, how much is going up, how much is going down. And it measures that 10 times a second or 20 times a second, super fast. So every tiny little turbulent gust of air, you can measure how fast was it going up. And simultaneously, you can measure how much water was in the air. So we have a separate instrument right alongside that anemometer that is measuring the amount of water vapor in the air. And now by correlating 
the amount of water vapor in the air when the air goes up and the amount of water vapor in the air when the air goes down, we can calculate the net movement of water, how much water was leaving going up from the surface into the atmosphere, and then assume, this is part of where it gets tricky, assume that that had to come from the surface and therefore represents net sublimation. So I guess this didn't work while it was like actively snowing? Right. So while it's actively snowing, these, these measurements do work, um, but typically there's much less sublimation occurring then because the snow flakes as they fall are sublimating, which makes the air humid, and therefore there's a net, net flux of water vapor. Um, we do see that, and uh, our study site was in Crested Butte, Colorado, where it snows a lot, and the air is very dry, and we found that even when it was snowing, the air was not saturated, and so there could still be a net sublimation term. Wow. Um, okay, so what did your study find? Um, so what we found was that the total sublimation in Colorado represented about 10% of the snowfall. So of the snow that fell in the ground, about 10% of it was lost from the local environment due to sublimation. We also found that that was an extremely sporadic process. So very little sublimation occurs, very little sublimation occurs, and then you get a really windy day where the snow is actually blown around, right? I'm sure that some of your, your audience has been outside on a snowy day when the snow is just pelting you in the face, that snow is sublimating. Um, and so we found that on days when there was very little blowing snow, there was much less sublimation. But then when the snow starts blowing into the air, it's mixing much more uh, rapidly um, and sublimating much more rapidly so that we get a huge loss on those blowing snow days. So you have this information now. What? How is it useful? How will it it go into practical use? So a lot of the measurements that we made can provide a, a benchmark for water resource managers to better understand their system of how much do we think is lost in Colorado in particular. They will go into the scientific literature, which will improve models. So people who are trying to write hydrology models to simulate processes, people who are trying to study climate change can put in some much more detailed understanding of the sublimation terms so that hopefully models are better able to predict future runoff, future flood forecasting, and future impacts of climate change. Right. So even like down to wildfires are impacted by how much snowback there is, correct? So this is just one more like little piece of the computer models that can help with that long-term forecast. Better understanding the, the water available in the soil changes our understanding of wildfire processes, of ecological processes. Um, there are a lot of other consequences to better understanding the water cycle. So what's next? Are you planning to do this study in other locations? In the immediate future, we have a lot of work to do just processing the data that we collected and interpreting it and understanding it. I would love to go back and measure, for example, sublimation over forest canopies. So a lot of the mountains in the Western US have forests in them. We tried to stay away from forests in this first study because it just adds a huge additional complication. Um, but we know that there's a lot of snow that's held in the forest canopy. After a snowfall, there's a lot of snow in the tree and then a few days later it's gone. And in wet environments, that snow has mostly sloughed off and landed on the ground. So it doesn't make much difference. In dry environments, a lot of that also blows out of the trees and sublimates. And so we would love to put out towers and make measurements above forest canopies to better understand how much sublimation occurs from the forest canopy itself. Um, the other really big missing piece that I, I haven't figured out how to do yet, and so this isn't an a immediate plan, um, is to better measure uh, sublimation fluxes at the very tops of mountains, basically. So we now know, and we, we kind of knew this before, but we've really quantified it. We know better how much snow sublimates from blowing snow. Um, and we know that on the tops of mountains, that's where you get the most blowing snow. You get almost constant snow blowing off of every little ridge line in the mountains. But this is an incredibly challenging environment to make any measurements in. Uh, both because of the cold, the lack of power, the lack of accessibility in the winter. And so we're trying to find 
where we could make measurements that would help us better understand how much snow is lost in those environments, because it's probably much, much greater than 10%. Um, and so there's a question of how does that influence the basin total water balance? A thought just occurred to me, is there ever been a study or any thought of studying the opposite of it going, like going yeah. from a gas to a solid and does that happen and where does that happen? Yeah. So as I said, sublimation is really this uh, equilibrium process. It's going both ways all the time. And what we what we see on the ground, if you go out on really, really cold days, is what's called hoarfrost, um, where you actually get frost deposited right on top of the snow surface that was already there. And you'll see these giant crystals that can grow up overnight. Um, and so that is exactly what you're talking about. That's snow you know, vapor deposited onto the snowpack rather than lost. Um, and we saw on really calm, clear days, we were, we were trying to measure that as well. Um, we would often see pretty much a net balance through the day where there was snow that sublimated over uh, during the day. And then overnight, it condensed back onto the snow surface. And so that the net effect was essentially zero, but there's a huge flux both ways. Um, it was really cool to see. We we had grad students who got to live in this remote research site for three months, and they would go out and very, very carefully weigh a box of snow. <laughs> so they would weigh it in the morning, first thing in the morning, you brush all the snow off the side, make sure they knew what they were measuring, get a detailed mass balance, do an estimate of how much snow is in the box, put it out there, let it sit quietly all day, make another measurement right before the night, put it back, right? So repeating that, and you could see the changes in mass in this box from day to day. It was, it was really fascinating. Hey, thank you so much for watching. While you're here, check out some other videos you just may like.